Hello, my name is Marsha Iman. I'm the city historian for the city of Sacramento, and I'm also uh, the manager here at the Center for Sacramento History. And I want to welcome uh, Dr. Stephen Avella here today. Um, I've asked him, he, Steve is um, probably the best historian on the history of Sacramento and on the McClatchy's in particular. And I've asked him to come in and have a conversation about the legacy of the McClatchy family and of the operation of a locally owned newspaper as well and, and kind of the changes that may be coming, are coming in the future as we lose that local ownership. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Dr. Avella. Thank you, Marcia. I, I, this room where we're taping is uh, was like home to me for a number of years. This is where I saw all the McClatchy materials. This is where I interacted and talked with any number of people who worked for the B, who knew CK and or at least knew about him. And uh, I, well, it's a it's a nice room. It brings back a lot of good memories of of, of a wonderful experience here at the Center for Sacramento History. This is a wonderful place. Thank you. Well, maybe now would be a good time you want to show your book. Um, this is um, his book on C.K. McClatchy, uh, and it came out, what, two years ago? Yes, about two years ago. Yeah. Um, so, and we're going to talk about um, Charles McClatchy, or C.K., as he was better known, uh, in a little more detail. but. I wanted to start off, I was, as I was preparing for this, I found a quote um, from a professor, Joel Kaplan, uh, who is a professor of communication at the Syracuse University. And he's, this is what he said about the McClatchy newspaper chain. He said that McClatchy, unlike other newspaper chains, was of the highest quality. It's just, and then he goes on to say, it should also be noted that the McClatchy's Washington Bureau was the only news organization that fully questioned the intelligence leading up to the Iraq War. So what is that to you? What does that say about the newspaper, the integrity of the newspaper? It was uh, this locally owned newspaper company that expanded so dramatically. What does it tell, tell us about them? Well, it, it certainly is a reflection of the owners and of their commitment to truth in journalism and their driving desire that the public interest be served. That this, this was really kind of at the heart and soul of certainly James McClatchy, but even more so his son Charles Kenny, and perpetuated by Eleanor. They had what we call today a vision a way of understanding and making sense of the world that was very much predicated on telling the truth, uh, a sense of economic justice, and a sense of honesty and integrity in understanding America's place in the world. So the, the Knight Ritter news agency that the McClatchy's took over and bore sunlight, probably much to the consternation of the Bush administration about the, the question of WMD in Iraq, and they questioned it. They were really one of the few news agencies who were going, you know, head over heels to affirm everything that Bush and Cheney and everyone had, had said about the existence of WMD in Iraq. Iraq. Um, this, would have, this would have made old CK very proud, yes. I mean, he at sometimes took very principled stands against the grain. Now, this is what you think it is, but it's not. I, I, if I can just bring up one instance that would be roughly analogous, it would be relative to something very important today, public health. He began to blow the whistle about the prevalence of bubonic plague in San Francisco. Uh, this was in the early part of the century. The, the, the rats were there that were spreading this. Unfortunately, it was localized in a, in a kind of a racial, racist way on the Chinese, but he pointed out that the city of San Francisco was an unhealthy place to be and that public officers and the press, his, his, his fellows in the press there in San Francisco, some of whom were ideological allies, saying, no, no, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Um, CK kept hammering on this and hammering on this and hammering on this and giving voice to people in the know who said, yes, you're absolutely right. There is a plague issue here. We have to take the kinds of measures that are necessary to exterminate this plague. We have to clean up the city. We have to get rid of these rats. We have to 
do whatever it is that is going to make this a better situation. Now, again, the only thing that tinged it badly was that uh, CK had racist ideas about Asians, Chinese and Japanese, and that unfortunately was, you know, probably diminishes somewhat. But it's the same story. Look, here's the truth, and we're going to pursue it. So um, there were, it's interesting in kind of in, in the United States that uh, most cities and towns that they developed had newspapers, and often more than one. And typically in those cities, um, there would be a newspaper that tended to be more conservative and one that would be more on the liberal end. Mm -hmm. um, liberal tends to have to be a dirty word now but more progressive, let's say. Mm -hmm. So here in Sacramento, what would have been the B and the union? Which, how would you have described those two? Well, it's a, it's a complicated question because uh, for a lot of the 19th century, the question here was the domination of the Southern Pacific Railroad, an, an, an issue that later Hiram Johnson, CK's good friend, would ride into the governor's office and eventually begin to corral the power of the railroad in California. But here in, in Sacramento, uh, the question was uh, complicated. First of all, Sacramento wanted the railroad. We, the, the decision to make this a terminus, the decision to build the shops and to provide jobs for people, and then the, the networking that it provided for not only state but national markets, and especially in the fruits of, of the Central Valley, the fruits and vegetables of the Central Valley. This, this was a good thing. Sacramento wanted this. Except that the railroad, already in the 1870s, began to exercise uh, what some considered to be a deleterious impact on the city's politics. This is a problem, <laughs> not just in Sacramento and elsewhere. Big companies want things their way. They want land. They want rights of way. Uh, they don't want anybody snooping over their shoulder. They want to, to make sure that their tax burden is as low as possible. And in this contest, <laughs> interestingly, the Union was one of the first, the, the paper, it's actually older than the B, was one of the first to sound the toxin against this and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, you have to respect de democracy here. You have to leave our elected officials alone. And you have to consider your needs in, in, in light of what we might call the common good. Interestingly, James McClatchy was on the other side of that. Because uh, every once in a while there would be you know, disruptions among uh, people here and, and agitation against the railroad. And the railroad would, uh, as it did other places, it would threaten to shut things down here. Okay, if this is the way you're going to be, if you're not going to give us this right away, if you're not going to you know, help us with infrastructure or anything, we'll just move elsewhere. We'll go someplace else. Um, and, and their influence in this regard uh, was considerable. Uh, we can look at some of the origins of the efforts to move the state capital out of Sacramento, move it to San Jose, move it elsewhere. I mean, these were all intended to scare the living hell out of Sacramento and say, you shape up or we're going to ship out. James McClatchy was... Among those, they, they sent a delegation to the railroad's headquarters in San Francisco and said, oh, please forgive us. Please don't do this. Uh, you know, please uh, help, uh, help us understand that, you know, help, help us find a way to make Sacramento acceptable to you. And, and, and that's, in fact, what happened. Um, for a long time, the, I don't want to use the word collusion, but the word, the, the association of the McClatchy's with, with the interests of the railroad were, were quite uh, well known. Uh, they got free passes on the Southern Pacific, uh, and they maintained a very friendly relationship with the uh, political officer of the Southern Pacific, who was a good friend of theirs. Now, when the Southern Pacific began to change ownership and its, its, its leadership moved elsewhere, then the agitation against the Southern Pacific began to rise, and the B itself began to take a position, you know, you people need to really kind of respect who we are and stop interfering with our politics. And then when CK comes, CK's got this crusading side, general uh, form of journalism, he's sort of melodramatic, but he, you know, he kind of identifies the railroad as this behemoth and is forever looking for, you know, the influence of 
the railroad on the city politics. And Sacramento is not a big city, it doesn't have a, <coughs> a very complicated government structure, but CK devotes gallons and gallons of ink to uh, under, you know, to, to uh, exposing the activities of pro-railroad people and who's in, the in, in, who's in the pay of others. And, uh, and one of the people they, they target is the, the great land developer here, Bartley Cavanaugh, Bart Cavanaugh, who uh, was a, a minion of the railroad and who helped people uh, facilitate uh, that, uh, that relationship. I, but it also got complex, again, that to, to the question of it's hard to, to draw signs uh, right at the beginning. Among C.K.'s best friend was a fellow by the name of Tom Fox. Now, this is where the personal, or the political becomes personal. Tom Fox um, was a local insurance man, but he was also kind of an agent of the railroad, and he, he was involved in local politics. Tom Fox had befriended C.K.'s brother-in-law, a fellow by the name of Kelly. Ella's, McClatchy's brother, who was an alcoholic, a ne'er-do-well, always in, in his cups. And uh, poor Kelly began to get sick and, and had to be taken care of. Well, for whatever reason, the McClatchy's didn't take him in. I don't know why. I never saw that. That must have created some consternation. But Tom Fox did. He picked up the McClatchy brother-in-law, took him home, and he died in Tom Fox's home. This forged an everlasting bond between Tom Fox, who had these somewhat compromised political values and association with the railroad, and the, the McClatchy family. I mean, this, and uh, it even led to arguments between C.K. and his brother Valentine. Valentine wanted to go after Fox and, and nail him to the wall, and actually did that while C.K. was out of town. And this, this created tension between the two brothers that would ultimately lead to their, to their split up. But this is where, you know, where the B comes down, and I'm using B and CK kind of interchangeably because there was no editorial board. There were no stockholders looking over his shoulder. The, the, the B was the extension of CK's mind and his, his attitudes, and he surrounded himself with people who, who shared those. And if you didn't share them, you were out the door. So. What, what, how does the, the McClatchy family contribute to the city? Well, the issue is, of course, complicated, uh, but there were other things that I think pointed more directly rather than even political issues uh, to their contribution. Because uh, we both have reread the thesis about the 1918 pandemic mm -hmm. and kind of looking at um, the way the two newspapers at the time reacted to that um, with the um, B actually printing uh, ways to make your masks at home uh, versus the union that didn't support wearing masks. Mm -hmm. So do you want to um, talk about that, you know, kind of the reaction to a pandemic now that we're in a pandemic yeah. now? Um, and and the, the role that a news, the newspapers played in actually um, the, as the information source for that at the time. Well, that, that insistence on, on public health, the, you could draw a line of concern from C.K. McClatchy's concerns about the bubonic plague and its transmission down to that. So it's, it's no mistake that, that, the, the, um, that the bee, or no coincidence that the bee would, would be very vigilant about, about that sort of stuff. Um, the Union, it's harder to explain, Marcia, because it, it undergoes so many transitions in ownership. Now, in 1918, I'm not quite sure who, who was in, because it was like a revolving door in the Union, uh, uh, really until, you know, ultimately the B had to kind of underwrite it to keep it alive for a while. Uh, but by that time, by 1919, 1918, their polarization on issues uh, was much was much sharper than it would have been early on. Uh, the leadership of the union would certainly have been more politically conservative, and and in a nod of tribute to the McClatchies, 
the B, the Union had to make itself the anti-McClatchy. Whatever they wanted, we didn't want. There was, there was a sense that the McClatchy's were bullies, that they were dominating the city. They had larger circulation of the paper. They had a better foot in, in the business community because of their ads and others. So uh, those who were anxious to take over the Union were, and who did, uh, were not inclined to be uh, echoing whatever the McClatchy's said. So some of that opposition, I think, uh, could be attributed to personal animus. We don't like you, we don't want to, and, and, and we're the paper of those who detest the McClatchy's. And there, there were a cadre of them in Sacramento by this time. They had stepped on a lot of people. They had, you know, opened up a lot of things that, that people did not want to open up. They, it, today, if we were to look at how they reported about court trials, I mean, they judged people guilty <laughs> before they even, and that, that was the reporting. Oh, this person did this. And in one instance, I mean, it was CK's reporting that that led a mob to uh, lynch someone, a, a guy who had been accused of child molestation. And that had not been put on trial, but it seemed like everything was against him. Everyone, and they ran this as lurid front page, things of what this guy had done to a child. And, and people, they had to transfer him to San Jose to jail, but they got him in San Jose. They pulled him out and killed him. Uh, well, this is, you know, CK uh, contributed to the day you know, the papers would be sued for that kind of uh, fouling of the, of the judicial process. But um, that was kind of, uh, you know, a, a regular part of how CK, CK saw things moralistically. Good and evil, bad and right and wrong, light and darkness. This guy went to this theater all the time and saw all these 19th century melodramas that we, we could kind of caricature as, you know, ha, what some guy with a what must I, I got you now, and then Dudley Do Right coming in and, and, and saving the day. That, that was part of CK's world. Charles Dickens was part of CK's world. And the, Charles Dickens is not at all subtle about who's right and who's wrong in dealing with the issues of society. But the, 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 the pandemic or the epidemic here in Sacramento um, drew a responsible uh, position from McClatchy and the Bee. And I would suspect in no small measure, in part because of concerns about his own family, because of concerns about Ella, who was not always in the best of health, and C.K. himself wasn't always in the best of health. So um, that's how I think I would come down on that. For health, for health reasons? But he had supported health care issues like the, uh, in the past. And Hiram Johnson, I noticed in the newspaper, was campaigning for a broader national health care. Oh, yeah. At yeah. that time. So yeah. that's that, another thing that I found fascinating is that the, drawing those parallels between then and now, it's definitely um, the issue of health care was, was there in 1918. In, in the general context of the progressive era here in California and nationwide, progressivism was, in the, it was not unified, but one of its salient features was a concern about public health. Public health uh, bodies in, in local governments began to become prominent as people, well certainly by the, you know, the late 19th century, they discovered that germs caused disease and so cleaning up municipal cleaning up um, sometimes spearheaded by women's groups uh, led to the creation of public health institutions on the city and the state level as well but this this was identified and recognized as a function of government and that they would have the resources and the ability to coordinate uh, reaction and response in, in to, to the extent that he subscribed to the progressive ethos, and generally for him, the progressive ethos was anything Hiram Johnson said it was. There, there yeah, was a sym was symbiotic relationship that that uh, uh, C.K. was a kind of a hard-edged and cynical guy, but when it came to Hiram Johnson. And he was in love. <laughs> I don't mean that in a literal sense. He wasn't a gay man, but but the, the Hiram really came to dominate his 
his agenda in a way that it was almost reflexive. He could not abide anyone who criticized Hiram Johnson and uh, backed him, even when Hiram wasn't on his side all the time. Hiram, uh, you know, to, so to speak, ratted out on the question of, of prohibition. Uh, ultimately had to vote for the prohibition amendment to the Constitution, which C.K. was deadly against, against not only because of his own uh, drinking propensities, but because he considered it a violation of, of uh, the personal freedoms of, of, of human beings and, and uh, didn't think it would work. It spent a lot of time investigating that. It didn't uh, work, did it? No, it didn't. And, you know, the, the futility of trying to regulate certain kinds of personal behavior that don't seem to have social consequences, although alcoholism did. And in his case, and in his son's case, it, it had disastrous uh, impact. But um, he, was, um, he, he was entirely smitten with Hiram Johnson, who actually began his life as an enemy. <laughs> of C.K. McClatchy, his career as an enemy of C.K. McClatchy. Uh, and uh, his, his father had been one of C.K.'s uh, biggest antagonism, took him to court, you know, sued him whenever he got the chance to do it. But then Hiram, all of a sudden, and I would probably characterize the, the, his participation in, in the Abe Roof matter in, in San Francisco when he, when he takes over the prosecution of Roof and the malefactors of great wealth there in San Francisco, uh, that's where things begin to soften and then CK is, just, just the volume of their correspondence, Marcia, just the volume of their correspondence. These guys wrote to each other sometimes twice a day, long letters. Of course, they both had secretaries that they could dictate, my dear Hiram, my dear CK. The, 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 the Johnson papers at the Bancroft Library are loaded with these. So just to give a little context, when um, Hiram Johnson's father, the probably the end... Um, Grove Johnson. Right, was uh, a railroad executive, mm -hmm. which yeah. McClatchy was, um, uh, had, was opposing them. Like By this time, he, they were in opposition, yeah. Right, and so just as for the general audience that would be watching this, so... The other thing is, is that Hiram Johnson, um, starting off as a prosecutor, or um, then moving his way up the ladder, kind of w w politically, so that people, because a lot of people watching this may not know, do you want to describe his rise yeah. to power? Yeah, he uh, he was uh, he was son of Sacramento too. Uh, his father was Grove Johnson. He also had another brother who was a, an attorney too. The, the the Johnson brothers had a joint company here, a joint. Uh, attorney shop here. Grove was a difficult man. He was a difficult, contrary man. Uh, I know him primarily because of his clashes with C.K. McClatchy, and he knew how to hit and hit hard. And so uh, the McClatchys were subject to a number of libel suits in the 1880s and 1890s. Again, the, the style of reporting and the things that they said Today wouldn't wouldn't pass muster with a with a, a newspaper's uh, you know legal office, but they said a lot of things and then got sued a great deal and often not always but often Grove was one of the ones pushing the lawsuit and they lost a couple of them that caused them to have to pay out big bucks. Um, in the in the 1890s there was there were efforts to start another newspaper here in Sacramento and Grove Johnson was suspected had been part of that. Another evening paper that would have uh, given direct uh, competition to the McClatchy papers who, you know, had kind of acted sort of like lords of the realm. And that, that nearly pushed the bee to um, bankruptcy. I mean, they, 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 all, they already had suffered a near-death experience when their typographers went on strike. And this, this newspaper business really uh, created uh, a serious problem until eventually they were able to, to get rid of it. It all collapsed. Um, Grove had a vitriolic hatred of the McClatchy's. Hiram and his brother, however, seemed to have another relationship with their father. 
and they both begin the practice of law in Sacramento. Hiram works for the city government for a little while, does some things that C.K. approves. He seemed to be kind of a Mr. Fix-It and a cleanup kind of guy. But then he moves to San Francisco, and that's where he pursues the career with the, great, the graft prosecutions in San Francisco. Out of that, he catapults into state politics, and then ultimately the United States Senate. His election as senator of, or excuse me, as governor of California in 1910, ushers in uh, a compliant legislature, and they begin to really kind of recreate California in in the progressive image. A lot of things begin to move forward here that uh, had been held back by previous administrations. Railroad dominated it, uh, pre uh, uh, administrations, according to C.K. Um, so his, his stint as governor here was, was quite fantastic, very, very popular, very successful. Uh, he had managed to win not only the support of Northern California, but Southern California too, which were considered almost two separate states uh, back in those days. And then he catapults himself to the Senate 19, in 1916, 1917. And then with CK's urging, he runs for president in 19, 1920. Wilson's at finishing its second term. Republican Party is sensing great victory. And at CK's urging, Hiram gets into the primaries, actually wins a couple of them, but then in the end kind of fades out. Something happens during that 1920 campaign. Casting around for a vice presidential running mate, Warren G. Harding apparently approaches Johnson. Would you like to be the vice president of the United States? California, he's got progressive cred. Harding is a conservative Republican, but not, you know, like his, his own uh, successor, Calvin, Calvin Coolidge, you know, more rock-ribbed. You know, he's, not, he's not that at all. Uh, and Hiram asks C.K., what should I do? Now, Hiram wasn't a wilting flower. He, he had his own ideas. He wasn't inclined to accept it because he didn't like Harding. But C.K. gives him the, no, no, don't do that. You're, you're, you're going you're gonna, to, you, there's greater things for you than this. And so Johnson resists and says no, and then the nomination goes to Calvin Coolidge. But I, Johnson could have been president. Harding dies in 1923. And this was probably the apogee, the highest point of C.K.'s dreams. He yeah, wanted. San Francisco, actually. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was food poisoning, or you know, the allegation was his wife poisoned him. That's not true. Well, but, he was a philanderer of the utmost. No, no, he was, wasn't a healthy man to begin with. And, um, but he, um, C.K. wanted, as he felt his influence growing, under Johnson, his influence grows considerably throughout the state. He's, he's more attended to, he's more listened to. He, and again, he and Johnson are going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth all the time. Face-to-face -face meetings, letters, communication of various sorts, advice, what do I do here, favor doing, you know, what can, what can you do for me, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it was his hope to be able to create a president of the United States, to have, you know, to go from his sphere of influence here in Sacramento, which he never intended to leave, but to extend his influence throughout the state without buying more newspapers, and then nationally, to be someone who would be in the know in the presidency and advising him, not only on domestic policy, but by the 1920s, C.K. had developed some pretty strong positions on foreign policy, you know. That's, Is he an isolationist? Yes, yeah, he, uh, uh, to the extreme. His argument uh, was that this, you know, uh, extending America's influence abroad was too costly, and too violative of our national purposes. He hated imperialism. He hated missionaries, because they went there to impose not just their religion, but their culture 
on other people. He was extremely sensitive to that. But he wanted nothing to do with things like the World Court. He wanted certainly nothing to do with the League of Nations. None of, and he, he kept a hawk-like uh, observation on, on, on any American interest in any of these international bodies. He, 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 was, he was on the road a lot in the 1920s. He was going to turn over a lot of the newspapers to his son Carlos, who had returned from the war and was you know, active in the Bee and, and helped form the Fresno Bee. Uh, but even from his travels abroad, he left wonderful diaries of, of these things. Whenever he senses that something's going on, or that there are untoward American interests, and he, he visits embassies, he, vis he touches base with local legations, he hires stenographers, he's writing back to Johnson, and he's writing back to San Carlos, be careful, they're making approaches here. We're, you know, we might we might have uh, participated, for example, and the League of Nations was already doing drug interdiction in the 1920s. This was a, already an international issue. How could we, how could we stanch the flow of illegal drugs? I suspect I'm suspecting it would be heroin and poppy derivatives, things of yeah. things okay. of that nature, opium. Um, no, 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 no," he said. "That's th that that that's not a place where the United States should be. We shouldn't be doing that. We sh certainly shouldn't be surrendering ourselves to, uh, and our not, our sovereign rights to any international court of jurisdiction. What what authority do they have over Americans? My estimation of that, Marcia, is that while it was understandable within the context uh, that. While America in the 1920s uh, had an isolationist attitude towards certain aspects of, of, of the world, we also were commercially engaged with the world. And I don't think CK appreciated that, that levels of cooperation and coordination would have, would, have benefited the, would have benefited America. And then, of course, the hindsight issue. You know, if we had been active in international affairs. If we had, for example, attempted to right some of the wrongs of the Treaty of Versailles, if we had participated even indirectly in the United Nations, might we have made a difference in Asia, in, in checking and, and uh, holding back the aggressive actions of Japan against China, and, and thereby slowing the spread of this, this great, greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere that they fantasized. Uh, and of course, the most obvious would be the conditions in, in Western Europe, uh, particularly the question of debt forgiveness. Uh, now, the, CK, although he hated Coolidge, uh, he, he, he kind of agreed with Coolidge's attitude towards any kind of restructuring of the war debt. I mean, the, the Germans owed an enormous war debt to the, to the English, the Italians, the French. It was very, very calculated in a way that was intended to economically cripple them, and it did. It, um, and these countries, in turn, owed us lots of money because President Wilson had approved not only private capital loans, but also the federal government lent them. So the, the, the Germans were paying the Allies, the Allies were paying us, and nobody was really winning here. So that lack of understanding of, of how international finance worked was also, uh, I think, influenced CK. They, well, they hired the money, didn't they? That was Coolidge's re retort. That certainly would have been no, no. We don't, we don't go along with any of this debt restructuring and all that. But again, we're speculating. But might it have made a difference if Germany's burdens had been had been lower? They have been less likely to have accepted. Right. Yeah. Hard. If, if the, the you know the one might not have have, a, have allowed the you know the seed to to find uh, good ground there in 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 in, in Germany and. Because there were enough people who had concerns about Hitler. I mean, he, he didn't win with huge majorities. So right. this might this have, have turned the other way. But the, again, the hindsight question uh, of CK's attitudes towards international affairs 
which he communicated regularly to Johnson, who became one of these irreconcilables. He, he was, I don't know how much they had to push Johnson to do this, but he also became adamant and, and bullheaded about all of this stuff. Uh, uh, might, uh, things have been different if the two of them had a more realistic attitude towards what had changed after World War I. The United States was an international power. Uh, and, and that preserving some sort of Fortress America attitude uh, might have had some nationalistic appeal and waving the flag and, you know, America first above all and we're going to take care of ourselves. But in the long run, uh, eroding international ties was going to work to our detriment. Was that something that he actively promoted in the newspaper as well? Yes, yes. That appears in regular not only in the editorial direction of now but we're talking the Sacramento paper, the Fresno paper, ultimately Modesto is added onto that too. So the, he's dictating that, uh, that policy he, and he, he kept, even when he allowed Carlos to form the Fresno Bee and gave him a lot of, he, he wanted to see what was going in that paper. And he, of course, the first law of the bees was absolute fealty to Hiram Johnson. Whatever Hiram said, that's what we do. And then, of course, always checking with him and, and interviewing him and getting his opinion about things. Uh, and so it not only appeared there, but it also appeared in his columns. Of course, he's traveling. He's going around the world. He's spending a lot of time in Western Europe. He even goes to the Holy Land. Uh, writes back these effusive travelogues. They're very, they're very interesting. And then also getting in his, uh, his positions on, you know, well, we shouldn't be doing this or we shouldn't be going into here. And, um, he is a, uh, uh, it's an interesting paradox. I mean, he's experiencing the complexities of life and the realities on the ground as he travels to Paris and Berlin and in Vienna, he's, he's actually trapped in his hotel and there's a little uprising in there and he can't get out for a little while. He sees all these things. But unfortunately, he was in a bubble. He, 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 he took America, he took Sacramento with him wherever he went, whatever, wherever he's going. He's comparing Rome, Paris, Berlin, Madrid, Jerusalem with Sacramento. Really? So in some ways, his, his world is always really kind of, this is the axis on which the world turns. This is my city. This is, this is, uh, you know, this is kind of the archetype of what a good city, or what a good city should have. You know, for example, going to Paris and seeing the, the tree line, Champs-Élysées, and other, oh, we, you know, I, I, I'm for trees too. And so we should have more of them here in, in Sacramento. Um, uh, these great cities, and these great communities, and the interesting people he meets. And, and he's, always, he's always meeting with people on the site. Ella goes out shopping or visiting or something, and he meets with local officials or local other, other journalists, friend journalists that he had met abroad. And, and they're discussing these media issues, which then he writes down, either for his columns or in these effusive letters back to Hiram Johnson. I'm just curious because um, how much of that is um, that Sacramento is his bubble in that sense that I'm when you were saying that I was thinking about um, Robert Dalek's book on JFK and talking about how JFK described when he went out into Europe and all of these different places it changed the way he viewed the world mm -hmm. and he wanted to be more expansive which CK seemed to have a very different reaction where he was comparing his world to everything else and not that eye-opening of an experience for him in some ways. I've thought about that too, Marcia. Uh, you know, I wrote the book and then you're always thinking about it, what could be different, what could be better. And I, I pondered that question about CK's international travels and, and what I've come put together, I don't know if it's right or if other historian would have, have a problem with this, but the 1920s were an era of great American tourism. It's really, you know, the, the wealthy, the, the, the highborn could afford to go and spend summers in Europe and so on and so forth. But in the 20s, uh, that touristical approach seemed to expand. Now, 
we experience here in California elsewhere an expansion of, of tourism, the, the national parks and the localities of, of California become interesting. People travel, train travel becomes more, more accessible. But in the 20s, a lot of people went to Europe and did a CK day. They would go from one city to another and spend two, three, four months over there. There is a, a character to touristical travel that still exists today. I see it when I travel to Europe. I'm an American. And what are they doing? Why are they eating pasta in the middle of the day? Or, you know, why are they letting kids drink wine at table? I've, I've traveled in Italy a lot. And, and, and there is a propensity, and of course an industry now that kind of caters to that. Most of the big tour companies, you know, pro provide you with that touristic bubble in the bus and the places they put you and so on. So the idea of engaging another culture, um, I don't think is something that, that CK did except to look at it almost as if you would look at you know, a museum piece or look at animals in a zoo. Uh, oh, isn't that interesting that they do that? And then in CK's mind, because of his extensive reading and experience with, with journalism, you know, he has a very colorful language about, you know, the, the bearded and sandaled, swarthy people of, of Morocco and, and the, the, the wailing call of the museum. He, he kind of evokes all of these uh, somewhat stereotypical images that, again, reflect his mind. That I'm, this is what I read about when I read Alibaba and the Forty Thieves or, or Forty Thousand Nights. Uh, you know, the, the 40 Nights, uh, the, the abil his ability, and he's getting older, and he's not well in these times. His, his health breaks down several times when he's in Europe. Uh, his, his inability to really do what you suggested here, that, well, let, let's listen and see what the culture, uh, let's try to see it from their point of view. Uh, a sad deficiency in, in him couldn't really do it, couldn't, well-traveled, cultural, literate, appropriately impressed. My favorite story is when he and Ella go to see Mussolini, and they go into the, the piazza there, the Piazza Venezia, the office with the high ceilings and, and all of that, and they see El Duce, and they're, they're just overwhelmed by this guy, just overwhelmed. They are not fascists, either of them. But Mussolini flatters them, kisses Ella's hands, and, and praises C.K. and tells them to convey his, his, his uh, best to the Italians of California. But they're, they're just, you know, overwhelmed by the moment. And they, you know, Ella gives the fascist salute as she, as she leaves the place there. I don't think C.K. didn't do it and later becomes quite critical of Mussolini for his violations of civil liberties. But they're, they're you know, being taken in, a journalist in particular, an ordinary tourist, you know, oh my gosh, I get to meet, you know, Hitler, I get to meet uh, Mussolini. And, and albeit, you know, Mussolini doesn't have the sinister reputation that he would have later in his, his career, you know, but uh, it would be an indication of, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of awed and wowed by display of power in a man who really, uh, if he were an American politician, I would be skeptical of him and I would be running exposés on his graft and corruption and, and his murder of his opponents and those sort of things. That all seemed to go to the wayside. Yeah, that, that's, later on he, when he gets home and sees things a little bit more clearly. But, I think it was kissing Ella's hands that must have put him <laughs> over the edge.